You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point. Good. And now... Bend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. I don't know about that doing it all night long. (laughs) I'm getting a little bit old for that shit. (laughs) I like my sleep. I need it. Uh, Even if I can sneak in a nap in the afternoon. Oh, well. (laughs) Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on a Freaker Friday. The Friday of Labor Day weekend here in USA. And yeah, all of you laborers, here you go. We're giving you a Monday to celebrate all the work you do the rest of the year. Ain't you awesome? Now, those of you that don't get to have that day off, well, sucks to be you. Yeah, isn't that special? The government was so kind as to give us a day. And on a Monday, no less, so you can have a three-day weekend unless you don't get to have a three-day weekend. And then, once again, sucks to be you. Oh, well. It is a Labor Day weekend coming up, and I am keeping my Grammy ass at home. Or at least within, like, a 10-mile area. I'm, yeah, I'm not going... I'm not going anywhere. If I have to get on the frickin' highway, I ain't going. Because the idiots and assholes are out there loud and proud on regular days. So, put it on Labor Day weekend and it's like, holy crap, anoli. No, thank you. I'll just stay out of that mess. Besides, I would probably have to unleash my flying monkeys. Just saying. So, it's also the last day of August. So, woo-woo, it's a Friday, the last day of August, Labor Day weekend. My grandkids start school next week. (sighs) Oh, well, you're probably listening, if you are listening, at reallibertymedia.com, channel 10, or on the RLM Spreaker channel, or all kinds of other RLM places, and later to be on the RLM YouTube and BitChute channel. (sighs) Huh. And it's just, it's going to be one of those days. I can tell it already because it's been a wild day today. My mother, bless her heart, her cell phone quit. And she's got one of them flip phones. You know, she don't don't like the smartphone. Doesn't want a smartphone. She doesn't want to own any piece of equipment that's smarter than her. Her words. And which I I understand that, Mom. (laughs) I truly do. But they were trying to tell her because the phone that she'd gotten, she just got in June and they said, oh, there's no warranty on it. (laughs) Bullshit. I call bullshit. They wound up giving her a phone. Yeah. Because it's like, no, 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 no. Because it's on my account and I'm the authorizing person. And yeah, they wound up giving her a phone. We'll just leave it at that. Shall we? Yeah. Because, mm. Don't you be leaving my mom phoneless. I mean, she's got a landline, but she calls all of us kids on the cell phone because it's cheaper than paying long distance because I pay for her cell phone. So there you go. But it's just one of them little cheapy flip phones. And, and they, they then they told her that she got water in it, which, yeah, right. She's not even had it two months or has it been one month. Okay, it's been two months that she's had a little over two months. Uh Big business, big business. Oy, 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 oy. In any case, let's see, where do I want to be first? Where do I want to say, hey there, hi there, ho there? I see Gary Ellis over here uh, posting stuff like crazy on uh, Twitter. So is that lovely Becky Haynes. Hey, you two, how you doing? I got another stalker over here on uh, uh, Twitter. I'm, be- I'm up to 437 now. Booyah! So awesome. Okay, over here on Fakey Book, mm, not really a whole heck of a lot paying attention over there, and that's okay. That's okay. I have siblings that are checking in on the mom page to, you know, because I let them know the status of mom's phone, because she now does have a phone. But, yeah, all day long. 
<laughs> it's been one of those things. In any case, over here on Fakey Book, dear sister Catherine shared this. I find it amazing how hard it is to find another awakened or find other awakened ones in the gen in this general area. They always seem to be scattered all over the world. But as I pondered it deeper, I realized we've been placed strategically all over the planet, perfectly, and for a reason, like conduits to awaken the general areas around us and spread the light in our areas until it reaches all over the world and meets as one. Now, it has uh, like a Woodrum or something like that. Woodrum J is who wrote that. And yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. I think we are. We are here to let's spread the disease of liberty. Let's make everybody sick with liberty. Make them to where they all want to be freaking individuals so they don't have to deal with this nonsense stuff of, well, there's someone else that's in a position of authority and they said, I can't do that. But they can. It's kind of like playing canasta. Black threes are a natural discard. Red threes are worth 100, pa or 100 points. Unless you don't get your meltdown. And if you don't get your meltdown, then that goes against you. And yeah, they change the rules. Change the rules. Anybody out there ever play canasta? <laughs> I used to when I was a kid. And yeah, <clears throat> it was quite confusing. Tried to teach my ex that. And he said, this is bullshit. You change rules every time I turn around. Nuh-uh. <laughs> it's just Calvin Ball with cards. So... Let's see. I've been to Fakey Book. I've been to Twitter. Thank you, Barman, by the way, for tweeting me out over there on Twitter. I truly do appreciate it. Vinny, also, thank you very much. He shared the uh, what I posted in the Facebook RealLibertyMedia.com page. Um, I got, what? Got a notification over here on Twitter. Oh, they're going nuts over all kind of stuff. And it's like, what? What? Seriously? Stop it. Stop it. Okay, on realliberty.org, whole lots of people over here. Thank you ever so much, Barman and Real Liberty Media, for letting everybody know over here that I am live and in person. And you might be afraid. You might want to be really afraid. Just keep your hands to yourself, damn it. Because I'm calling sexist because they got boycotts, but they ain't got girl cots. That's sexist. <laughs> Over here on this effing site, Freedoms Network. Thank you once again, Grimmy, for letting everybody know that I am live over here. Who else is over here? Um, I see Jaffa was over here for a while, as well as Mental Pancakes, Grimmy, and KD Troxel. And if you haven't listened to that video that I posted a little while ago from Brother Polite, please, uh, knowledge, please listen carefully. Wow. Wow. Sharp individual here. He's a sharp young man. At least when it comes to the birthing process and with his own children and the the bullshit that they keep pulling on us and, and how they manipulate the system and, and get your DNA. Yeah. Pay attention to that young man. He's pretty sharp. Okay, over here on Minds. I got people actually reminding something that I shared. It's rather shocking. I'm rather surprised, but that's okay. Um, let's see. Other than that, they're sharing all kinds of politically... Inc Whoa, wait a minute. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, blog is resurrected. Oh, politically incorrect dharma. Ah. I may have to go there. I don't know if I'll read it. But I'm going to have to go there, if for no other reason, just to see how long it is. Hmm, well, it looks like a history lesson, so I may have to save that for another time after I give it a good read. Um, now, if you want to be able to give me static, you need to come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Say hey to everybody. Give me some static. I'll give it back. Over here in the chat, they will give you uh, static back as well. So, you know, they're they're kind of crazy like that. So. Uh, da -da. Oh, yeah. I saw that about the 
that uh, actress that got shot. You know, if nothing else, that may be the final straw to get an awful lot of people to go, what the hell? What the hell? She's an actress. She's a this. She's a that. You know, people people don't get all up in arms and, and all blusterated and all that fun stuff unless it hits them personal. And a lot of people are very, very attached to their little TV personalities. And when something like that happens to a TV personality, you'd be surprised how quickly people get all Twitter paid and get all pissy. And yeah, then next thing you know, there goes a neighborhood. So, okay, I needed a swig real fast. So, over here in the Real Liberty Media chat room, which if you're listening in on Spreaker, I know you can chit-chat over there, but I don't have the internet capacity, so come on over to Real Liberty Media and give me static in there. Barman, right up top, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? I also see the lovely Moose Girl, and are Moose, are the Moose and Grim going to be on this evening for the Freakers Ball, or is it going to be a Balls to the Wall? Inquiring minds would like to know. I also see the lovely Kate is here, and Kate and I were pondering, how do you spell Scooby, as in scooby dooby doo Is it with a Y? Is it I-E, or is it E-Y? I also thought of E-Y, but I don't think it's E-Y. I think it's just with a Y. Kate and I kind of sort of, but if you have an opinion, pop in the chat. Let me know. I also see that trusty feller is here. Trust no one, as well as Phantom. Hey, Phantom, how you doing, hon? Asmo is also in the chat, as well as Beth Z and Chalced Denis. Chloe E is here too. We got a lot of E E E I E I O's going on. Colfax 101 is also logged in as well as Cyborg Noodle. May you be touched by his noodly goodness. Wonderful bot that he is. I didn't know bots had noodly goodness, but he's a cyborg noodle, so what the hell? D underscore C is here as well as Dakota and Dan Tenny C just showed up. Hey Dan Tenny C. It's a balls-to-the-wall night tonight. Thank you, Grimner. How did Vinny do this afternoon? I was I was otherwise occupied and could not listen. Damn it. <sighs> okay, let's see. Dan, Tennessee, Frumpy's here. Hi, Frumpy. How are you doing? Gooberzilla. Goober sharing all kinds of things over here in the chat. I'm here as well as Gromit. Ibi Don C is also here as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor 2. And looky there. JJ's. No, no, no. JJ's is here. That Scottish feller that doesn't have anything on under his kilt. Oh, my. Hi, Wanna Taco. How you doing, hon? Not I know what I'm having for supper tonight. I have, I ma- I made a bake that's got um, potatoes and uh, celery and a creamy sauce with cheese and zucchini and summer squash, all made into a bake and and oh and summer sausage. Oh my goodness, nom 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 nom. It's very good, but tonight's leftover night. Because it's radio night, and so that's when I do my leftovers. Hi, Kozu. How you doing, hon? I also see Meister Bra. Oh, Vinny played hooky? Dang, Vinny. He must have been going somewhere for the weekend. Instead of waking for the weekend. Shame on him. Uh, let's see. Do-do-do. Meister Bra. Yeah, there we go again. Woody. I also see moi, 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 and we got a couple of poxes in the chat tonight. Pox, pox, poxified, and poxophone, as well as pom, 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 sauce. And looky there, the lovely Rain is also logged in, as well as RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel, who lets us know what the weather is if we ask her nicely. I also see Rob Works, who's fired up that bubbler several times, and we're going to have to break out the Scooby Snacks, dude. That's just all there is to it. I also see Sock Puppet. Hi, Sock. And the f Bominator Skittle is also here. And rounding out the crew, the one, the only, the Vin E. Ponder Gander on the loose. Um, yeah. I know, that is true, Goober. Our heroes 
It was so sweet of them. You know, they probably feared for their lives. But it was an air pistol. That would have left a mark. Mm. So, let's see. Where do I want to go first? Uh, better check my Twitter because I see all kind of stuff. Priorities are private. Really? Okay. Hmm. I saw that um, there was some naughty, naughty, naughtiness going on. Where was that at? Nope, nope, not that, not that, not that. I was thinking it was it was something to do with, and where did I see that? Hmm. Somebody shared something about um, how people in Syria, I think it was, exposed the nonsense. Maybe I put that in my pocket of the white hats. I was scrolling through my pocket. No, I did not put it in there. Damn it. Damn it. Well, it was out there. I seen it. I seen it with my own two eyes, not four eyes, two eyes. Hmm. So, let's see. Where shall I go? I don't think I... No, I didn't remind it. Hmm. I hate when that happens. You know, when I plan on doing something, and then I have a squirrel moment, and then next thing you know, I don't have a freaking clue. But I will get to this one, because, you know, seeing as how it is a Freaker Friday, and freaky shit happens on Freaker Fridays, which, yeah, it's been kind of a freaky-deaky day today. But... This is from thesun.co.uk. I uh, saw it over on Twitter. Sick doctor spared jail. Apparently a fertility doctor who spent the past 40 years impregnating women with his own sperm without them knowing is spared jail time. Dr. Donald Klein could have fathered as many as 20 children but was given a one-year suspended sentence. Probably because he didn't actually have intercourse with the girls. He just put his little swimmers. He was a retired fertility doctor who impregnated dozens of unwitting parents with his own sperm. Hmm. He, you know, he was given a one-year suspended sentence after pleading guilty to two counts of obstruction of justice. Well, you know, it is not justice. It's just us. We're the only ones that the rules don't apply to. That's what they say because they write the rules. And we need to say, well, <laughs> you know, we didn't have nothing to do with those rules. And so, therefore, we ain't abiding by them. Hey, turn it around. Throw it back at them. So, no other charges were filed against the 79-year-old um, Clint. Really? 79-year-old Clint. Hmm. Because um, Indiana law doesn't specifically prohibit fertility doctors from using their own sperm. Oh, that's why. Okay. Klein was charged after lying to investigators, potentially facing up to three years in prison on each count. What are they going to do with all if these children were to somehow meet each other and fall in love and want to go out and make babies? We can do then. Are these people going to be notified at least? Hmm. So, apparently, <clears throat> he was facing up to three years for each um, in prison for each count. But the charges stemmed from two confirmed cases of paternity. But children of women treated by Klein said DNA tests showed he is likely the biological father of as many as 20 of them. Now, Klein had told his patients that they were receiving sperm from medical or dental residents. Oh, what the heck? Who is calling? Mother, I am on the radio, you know, you silly woman. So, Klein had told his patients that they were receiving sperm from medical or dental residents or medical students and that no single donor sperm was used more than three times, according to court records. Now, some of the now adult children of Klein's former patients filed a complaint with the Indiana Attorney General's Office in 2014. 
after they became suspicious while scouring online reports to find biological relatives. Paternity tests performed um, performed by the Marion County Prosecutor or performed the what? This sentence is so fucked up. Oh, F-bomb so early in the show. Paternity tests performed. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office determined Klein was likely the biological father of at least two of his patient's children, according to court records. At least two. See, that's just like those diet pills that they sell you or the diet drinks or all that other fun stuff. You can lose up to 10 pounds in a week. That doesn't mean you're going to lose 10 pounds in a week. It just means you could lose up to 10 pounds in a week. They also don't tell you that that could all be water weight loss. They don't tell you the specifics of that till after you've already bit and swiped your card. That's how that shit rolls. So here when they say up to or at least, yeah. When they say no more than, then then I'll start going, oh, okay, you're being specific here. But no, they're not. Now, Klein, who retired in 2009, initially denied the allegations when he wrote to investigators, saying that the women who filed the complaints were trying to slander him. But on Thursday, he acknowledged that he had lied. Out of fear, I acted alone and foolishly lied. He said during the hearing with a sometimes shaky voice, which probably meant that, oh, we feel bad for you, you poor guy. But he mentioned only the two women who first filed complaints. He also didn't discuss his decision to use his own sperm in, a ni- in the 1970s and 80s. Now, court documents allege that Klein told six adults who believed they were his biological children that he had donated his own sperm about 50 times because he was trying to help his patients and didn't have access to fresh sperm, so he went into the bathroom and... (laughs) What a sick fuck. God dang. Jeez, dude. Talk about egomaniac. I'm going to impregnate as many women as I can, but I don't have to have sex with them. I'm just going to shoot my sperm in there. Sick bastard. Sick, 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 sick. I hope they make him pay back child support on all of them. Ooh. Becky's in Colorado. Cool. What part of Colorado, Becky? Northern? Eastern Slope? Western Slope, Southern. Don't have to give specifics, just general idea. <sighs> okay, so. Did I put that over there? God dang it. I clicked over there and then I don't remember if I put. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So, let me put this over on the reallibertyorg site as well, which if you're not a member, come on over and join in. It's slowly growing and it really is pretty cool. It's a nice little site. Image format, JPG, yada, 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 not supported. Ah, yeah, yeah, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Every once in a while I run into one of those lovely little things, but it'll still post the link. It just won't post the little preview thing. Oh. There we go. And I will put this over on the effing site as well. Seeing as how I'm Sharon and Sharon is Karen. Well, I don't know if Sharon really cares, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just us. Ain't no justice. Just us. It's the way they roll. So, now that I've done that one, let's just check out... Hmm... I don't know. I put so many links up here, but I'm trying to decide if I really want to go to them or not. How about I go with this one? I was going to go with this one on Wednesday, and then I kind of sort of spazzed. Don't ask me why. Y'all know me. This is from naturalnews.com. CNN caught red-handed fabricating fake news and fake sources. 
Watergate legend Carl Bernstein is complicit and refuses to ret retract news hoax. Now this was posted uh, the 28th of this month, so by Mike Adams. In a bombshell media scandal that's growing by the hour, the tag team of CNN and Watergate famed journalism legend Carl Bernstein have been caught red-handed, fabricating utterly fake news in a desperate effort to cast criminal blame upon Popo Trumpelstilskin. Now, the scandal is exploding across the media for, with the Washington Post and other media outlets now retracting their original reporting based on CNN claims, now proven false. That, um, and they attempted to assert the president had prior knowledge of the Trump Tower meeting with the Russians, which is an event that now appears certain to have been a deep state setup to ensnare Trump's associates. Now, the journalistic lies of CNN and Bernstein are so blatant and disturbing that even Glenn Greenwald, who helped break the Edward Snowden story, has published a scathing piece exposing the gross journalistic misconduct that now appears to be routine at CNN and other Trump-hating "Quote unquote news outlets," which you know, the thing that got me—I got to tell you this: thing that got me on this was when I clicked on it. It was FNN, Fake News Network, and I went, "Oh, I'm going to have to read this, even if it sucks shit. I got to read it." But <clears throat> I'm sure there's some people that are going to think it sucks shit. Sorry. Excuse me, I didn't need a drink. So CNN simply refuses to address the serious ethical and journalistic questions raised about this its conduct, warns Greenwald at The Intercept. And the substance of the CNN story itself regarding Cohen, which made headline news all over the world and which CNN hyped as a bombshell, has now been retracted by other news outlets that originally purported to confirm CNN's story. Well, have you ever watched those videos where they have from different places all across the country where the newscaster is reading the same exact verbiage? The only difference is where they put their emphasis, you know, when they're, when they're reading their script. At issue in, the, in all of this is CNN Bernstein claimed that Michael Cohen was not a source for their bombshell story, which originally claimed that anonymous sources confirmed Cohen was aware of Trump-Russia conspiracy and intended to deliver that information to Robert Mueller. Now, this original story was heralded by CNN as groundbreaking. Well, you, it may very well be groundbreaking, guys. As in, you've reached a new low. Earth-shattering news items, and it's breathlessly repeated by thousands of news outlets that are too freaking lazy to even look beyond the CNN. Oh God, let's not look for a backup source or maybe where they got their original. No, let's just take it the way they put it out there. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out all to be false. Cohn's own attorney, Lanny Davis, has now publicly admitted his original assertion was false. Michael Cohen had no such knowledge. Davis now explains and C or Davis now explains that Cohen had no such knowledge and CNN's original report was baseless. Yet, the, to the shock of everyone, CNN still refuses to retract the original story. Now, have you ever noticed that refuses or refuse and refuse are spelled the same? So CNN doesn't want to take their shit back. Hmm, sorry. Almost certainly because Carl Bernstein's name is also associated with it. And if Bernstein is outed as a fake news journalist who utterly fabricates false facts to take down another conservative president, then the entire history of Bernstein's reporting, including Nixon-era Watergate stories, 
must be called into question. If you tell a lie once, everything else you tell is questioned, or it should be. Now, the fact that Bernstein, who along with Bob Woodward, broke and chronicled the Watergate scandal that led to the eventual resignation of Richard Nixon from the presidency, was on the by or was on the byline, and it was significant, as it threw the weight and heft of his personal credibility behind the network story. Now, CNN intentionally deceived its audience claiming Davis was not the source, even when he was the source. In the piece, Bernstein, uh, Ciuto, and Cohen used anonymous sources to claim that President Donald Trump Stilskin, now former, um, or his now formal personal attorney, Michael Cohen, was willing to undercut Trump Stilskin's claim about the famed 2016 Trump Tower meeting that the president's son, Donald Jr., um, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and then campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, had with a Russian attorney with links to the Kremlin. Links to the Kremlin. Did he have cufflinks? that said USSR on them. Is that possible? Because I do remember seeing a meme many, many moons ago with uh, Trump's ties with Putin, and it was a picture of Trump and Putin standing together, and then the tie turned over and it said Trump's ties. And I thought, that's funny, that's witty. In any case, back to this. <clears throat> However, CNN, or I'm going to just start calling them FNN, deceived its audience in two ways. First, FNN falsely wrote that Lanny Davis was not a source when he actually was. And secondly, FNN made claims from an anonymous source that Davis has now exposed as being completely false. Yet FNN refuses to retract its original story or explain how it arrived at its original reporting. So in essence, FNN is caught in a huge journalistic scandal and is only digging deeper down the hole of fake news. Spewage! Now, the key people with knowledge on what FNN reported, Cohen and his own lawyer, insist that FNN's reporting about Cohen, what Cohen knows and intend to tell Mueller is false. That's according to Greenwald. And there's an entirely separate and more significant question about FNN's behavior here. Namely, the very specific claim they made about their source for that blockbuster story. Because Davis explicitly confessed that he was one of the anonymous sources for C FNN's July 26th story just as he was for the stories from the Washington Post and the New York Post. Yet remarkably, FNN, in its July 26 story, specifically claimed that Davis refused to talk to FNN about the story or provide any comment whatsoever. Now, Davis was in fact an anonymous source for this CNN piece as Davis admitted on Monday evening, adds Breitbart News. But, more importantly, the entire thesis of the entire story is entirely fake news, completely untrue, as revealed more than a week ago by Axion's Jonathan Swan. And that uh, refers to this Axion story by Jonathan Swan, which documents how Michael Cohen told Congress he had no knowledge whatsoever about whether Trump knew about the Russian meeting. And in that story, Swan reports that Michael Cohen told lawmakers last year in sworn testimony that he didn't know whether then-candidate Donald Trump had foreknowledge of the 2016 Trump Tower meeting with Russians. And three sources with knowledge of Cohen's testimony also um, tell Axios this. So, in other words, sworn testimony now utterly contradicts FNN's fake news. Yet FNN refuses to correct its story. Well, why not let it stand? Just leave it alone and just point out, ah, this is a little on the uh, false 
side. You know, put a little buzzer on it. Every time you open up that link, go, eh, wrong answer. Of course, you know, they, uh, Effinen claims its own fake news can never be questioned because that would be criticizing the media. Oh, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with criticizing the media. Sometimes you need to prod them along just a little bit. So how can it be how can they possibly justify refusing to address these questions and refrain from informing the public about these critical matters on a story that they themselves hyped for days? as a blockbuster well you know it's called selling selling a perspective and you really don't have to pot you don't have to pay now except for paying attention yeah one of the most significant stories yet in the trump russia saga hmm, really it turns out that fnn the washington post the new york times and other fake news, left-wing activist publishers, we don't dare call them legitimate spewage, I mean news organizations, they insist that their own lies can never be questioned, while they routinely call everyone else liars, traitors, and Nazis, including the Popo himself, which, you know, I, I just don't get that whole, you know, calling him a Hitler, because he doesn't have that little oops you missed a spot mustache thing going on so you know and the hair although his his hairdo is just about as styling possibly a more updated version but still you missed a spot mustache no it's not there so I'm just he mm, whole other whole other so apparently these organizations insist that their own lies can never be questioned, while they routinely call everyone else liars, traitors, Nazis. Well, and when they fabricate fake news, facts themselves, no one is ever allowed to question their reporting. Note it's reporting. It's not necessarily journalism. They are reporting what they, I found it, can I keep it? Bullshit. Now, FNN wanted the story to be true, of course, which is why they so heavily promoted it with bombshell language. And when they reported this, it was a major deal because it would have justified the continued existence of the special counsel's office despite a complete lack more than a year into the investigation since Popo fired now former FBI Director James Comey of... Um, Let's see. Okay, now that's that. Yeah. Y'all just, you needed to proofread that shit too. So, now CNN is caught red-handed. It flat out refuses to admit it fabricated the story in the first place. And they have to keep up the appearance of being journalists when in reality they are little more than activist Democrats. Hacks pretending to be journalists. I don't know that I would necessarily go ahead and call them those things, but I would call them faker, faker, belly acres. I would, I, I would go so far as to say that. And if FNN lied about Davis having refused comment when in fact he was one of their anonymous sources, then this is obviously a major journalism scandal. Greenwald, or as Greenwald pointed out, yet FNN the only ones with the ability to inform the public about what happened here is silent. This despite the incomparable importance which FNN breathlessly told its viewers the story carried. So, this goes on and on and on and on and I'm thinking, okay, yada yada yada, the horse is dead, you have beat it to death, you have beat it to death. FNN lied. CNN lied. Where is the journalistic integrity? It is not there because they are reporters. They are spewers. They are not journalists. And even journalists just write shit in a journal. Okay. What's this? I'm checking. I'm scrolling up here. 
checking out what's going on in the chat. Oh goodness. Let's see. Oh, color oh, Becky's gonna take a Colorado magic oil nap. Yay! <laughs> Becky, I understand that. Colorado's magic oil makes me take a nap too. It just doesn't make any difference if I puff puff pass or what. I'm ready for a nap. Okay. Let's see. So get that over here on this realliberty.org. Put it over on the Freedom Network. And basically the reason why I do this is so when I go back and I do my blog, my podcast blog, <laughs> if I didn't keep the tab open across the top, then I can go back to these pages and go, oh yeah, I did that one too. Oh yeah. Oh, goodness. Naughty, naughty, naughty. So, now that I've done the Faker Faker Belly Acre, and that one, and, you know, here's another one um, to do with journalists. It's from worldtruth.tv. Um, not real sure when they originally posted it, but it says, Journalists who expose CIA cocaine trafficking would be 63, but he shot himself twice. Arkansas. Yeah. For the better part of a decade, a San Francisco Bay Area drug ring sold tons of coke to the Crips and Bloods street gangs of Los Angeles and funneled millions in drug profits to an arm of the Contra guerrillas in Nicaragua run by the CIA. And the San Jose or the San Jose Mercury News found this. And on August 22nd, 1996, the San Jose Mercury News shocked the country with a series of articles entitled The Dark Alliance, detailing the CIA's connection to the crack epidemic that terrorized the nation in the 80s and destroyed countless lives in its wake. Now, after the article's publication, the story's author, award-winning journalist Gary Webb, was initially hailed as a hero before a massive smear campaign attacked his credibility and destroyed his career. So, Gary was born August 31st, 1955 in Corona, California, and he began his career in investigative journalism it's a rarity anymore, in 1978 as a local reporter for a, the Kentucky Post. In 1980, Gary won his first professional award for a 17-part series called The Coal Connection, which investigated the murder of an international coal company president with ties to organized crime. Now, Webb followed The Coal Connection with a scathing 1985 report entitled doctoring the truth and the report led to the an Ohio House investigation and subsequent changes to the state's Medical Practice Act. Gary began working as an investigative reporter for the San Jose Mercury News in 1988 and within a year his reporting contributed to the paper winning a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of the 1989 Bay Area earthquake and its aftermath. Now, the CIA crack and contras, or the story of a lifetime, you know, it wasn't until 1995 that Gary began work on what would become the biggest story of his career, when he received a tip about a cocaine trafficker named Daniello Blandon, or Blandon, and his relationship with an L.A. drug dealer, Freeway Ricky Ross. Now, over the course of a year, he interviewed dozens of witnesses, high-level government officials, and drug cartel leaders. And after meticulously piecing together his shocking discovery, Webb and the San Jose Mercury Times published The Dark Alliance. Now, while the importance of this, his report cannot be understated, The Dark Alliance 
was not the first time reporters had established the connection between CIA and cocaine trafficking. In 1985, journalist Robert Perry and Brian Barker from the Associated Press reported that various groups of the CIA-backed Contras engaged in cocaine trafficking in part to help finance their war against Nicaragua. Now, Perry would later call Webb an American hero for his in-depth investigation and reporting on the topic. In, the to or in a time when the Internet was in its infancy, Webb's report was released online with links included to all of his sources, demonstrating the power of free and open access to information. Webb's story quickly went viral before the term viral existed, and the article garnered hundreds of thousands of clicks every single day, prompting responses from the corporate lame-ass propaganda system, mainstream media, congressional leaders, activists, and the CIA itself. Now, initially, the agency seemed fa or seemingly failed to respond to Webb's story, but in true government fashion, it wasn't long before an army of corporate lame-ass propaganda system outlets began to defend the CIA and attempt to discredit Webb. In 2014, the CIA released documents detailing how they used a complicit media and a targeting or targeted strategy to denounce Webb's 200 or 20,000 word report. And Nicholas Dujmovic, who is the author of the CIA report entitled Managing a Nightmare, CIA Public Affairs and the Drug Conspiracy Story, it noted that the CIA watched these developments closely, collaborating where it, collaborating where it could with outlets who wanted to challenge Webb's reporting. And media inquiries had started almost immediately following the publication of Dark Alliance. Well, you can kill the messenger, but not the message. Due to the backlash from Webb's article, the Mercury News published an editorial calling his report flawed and reassigned him, which eventually prompted Gary to resign. Now, despite his resignation, Gary continued investigating the scandal he exposed and published his book, Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras, and the Crack Cocaine Explosion. He published this in 1998. He also continued to contribute to numerous reports and documentaries. Sadly, the story that became the most important of his career helped lead to Webb's downfall. Gary divorced his wife in 2000, though the two remained close during his final years, and after divorcing his wife, being unable to obtain work from newspapers and facing increasing debts, Gary was forced to sell his home. Can you say blackballed? On December 10th, 2004, Gary Webb was found dead of two allegedly self-inflicted Arkansas gunshots to the head. As the Independent reported in an interview with Gary's ex-wife Susan Webb, when removal men arrived on the morning of the 10th of December 2004, they found a sign on his front door which read, please do not enter, call 911 for assistance. Thank you. Webb's corpse was found in the bedroom with two gunshot wounds to the head. While we may never know what happened to Gary Webb on the day of his death, we must never forget the truth about what he exposed and the extraordinary measures the government took to silence him. And there is a video attached at the bottom of this. And yes, that tiger is crouching in the corner of its cage. It is cornered. And those critters get very, very dangerous when they get cornered. And you know, you know that you're over the target when you're catching that much flack. So, yeah. What is that? 
Uh, Lysander Spooner. Oh, he was exposing the government goon squad for their liberty-destroying ways over the hundred years. Yes, Lysander Spooner was pretty freaking cool. Okay, let me put this also over here. Now, that's probably not the first known case of Arkanside, but yeah. It's still very sad. When the truth has become the enemy, you know you are run, ruled by tyrants. Just saying. <sighs> okay, we'll do that. And then put it over here on the effing site. Hi, Estrella. I see that you're posting stuff over here. You go, girlfriend. You are a postin' woman, let me tell ya. Okay. Where, which one do I want to use? I'll just do that one. So, what's that? I gotta check out this thing that... Oh, no. Not that one. Not that one. We'll close that. Oh. Yeah, you'd be surprised what is no longer in textbooks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Gariel. I see you over there on Twitter. Okay. Now, this is one that I do believe, you know, if we're going to be talking about liars and cheats and fakers and murderers and all this other fun stuff. I believe Grimner shared this over in on the Freedoms Network earlier today. And I thought, oh, well, hmm, let's check this out. It's from globalresearch.ca, erasing the truth and fabricating fake narratives. Been doing it for years. Some say 2,000 years, and some even say that we haven't even been here 2,000 years. All that quote-unquote evidence is fake. So, yeah, you got to just, you got to do your own research and go with where your gut leads you. Because there's just entirely too many different, you know, it's like the flat earth. It's flat where I live. It is flat. And, you know, it is round. And yet it's flat. Because when I stand and I do a 360, I see round. So, what if it's both? In any case, back to this. Western media monopolies, appendages of the billionaire ruling class, select for narratives which glorify criminal foreign policies. Hence, these monopolies are cheerleaders for uninterrupted wars of aggression. Now, the ruling class policymakers hide their criminality beneath banners of freedom, democracy, and human rights. And these lies provide cover for what amounts to a Western orchestrated and sustained overse overseas holocaust and third, world third worldization of domestic populations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and you know what? I was listening to Mark Passio the other day, and he said that actually these leeches that be, I refuse to call them powers that be because I, I don't look at them as powers that be. They are leeches. They suck our energy. They suck our lifeblood. They suck our money. They suck everything away from us. They are freaking leeches that be. Now, these leeches that be, the way they avoid some of their karmic consequences is because they just give the orders. And although giving the orders gives them some karmic consequences, they don't get near the karmic consequences as the ones that carry out the orders. Because those that carry them out had the option to say no and walk away. The thought and the saying are not nearly as bad if you do not take it into action. But once you take action, that's where the repercussions kick in. 
So, the lies are further reinforced when those who advance these toxic policies are celebrated as heroes. This misplaced adulation negates the struggle for peace and the rule of international law. How about we just go with the rule of natural law and just call it good? Now, the lies and misplaced adulation also serve to legitimize the West's proxies in which Al-Qaeda, or better known as Al-Qaeda, to those of us in the chat, and in Syria, and the neo-Nazis in Kiev. Aw, oh, the human rights community lost a champion. Well, it sure as hell wasn't McCain. <sighs> what was it I saw a meme the other day? Um, cancer. Doing what no other man could do, could or would do. The Great Equalizer. It's a sad way of looking at it, but yes, it did. Now, apparently the adulation then is part of the appara apparatus of deception. And it brands those who should be facing trials at, um, at The Hague as heroes. Kind of like Grandpappy Bush. You know, way back during World War I. And it also erases the truth, which is a vital component for peace and international justice. But we can't have justice because they have just us, us leeches that be. So, um, that is by Mark Taliano, who is a research associate at the Center for Research on Globalization and the author of Voices from Syria. So, thank you, Grimmy, for that. It was just a little quickie, but thank you, hon. I appreciate it. Let me see. I got some, I got some gadunkers. Hi, Aunt. I see you over here on realliberty.org. Good to see ya. Hope you haven't been working too hard. Now, let me put this one over here as well. Grimmy already put it on the effing site, so I will just put it over here in the RLO and in the chat. I don't know if you put it in the chat or not. Uh, white power. Yeah, right. White power. Oh, shit. I clicked at the wrong place. I hate when that happens. <sighs> okay. Now, let's see. I'm going to go to my pocket now because I did put some wonderful things in my pocket. Um, let's see. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Keep that cursor rolling, Grammy. How about we go to the sugar conspiracy? That is another one of those where they tell you it's one thing. You know, it's a diversionary tactic. Now, this was originally pu uh, published in theguardian.com, August of 2016, I believe. Yes, or no, not August, April of 2016, excuse me. In 1972, a British scientist sounded the alarm that sugar, and not fat, was the greatest danger to our health. But his findings were ridiculed, and his reputation ruined. So how did the world's top nutrition scientists get it so wrong for so long? Well, Robert Lustig is a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of California who specializes in the treatment of childhood obesity. A 90-minute talk he gave in 2009 titled Sugar, the Bitter Truth has now been viewed by more than six or more than six million times on YouTube. In it, he argues forcefully that fructose, a form of sugar ubiquitous in modern diets, is a poison culpable for America's obesity epidemic. And it's not just obesity that it causes, but that, that's, that's the obvious one the in-your-face one, if you will. 
Now, a year or so before the video was posted, Lustig gave a similar talk to a conference of biochemists at Adelaide, Australia, and afterwards a scientist in the audience approached him. Surely, the man said, you've read Yudkin, and Lustig shook his head. Well, John Yudkin, said the scientist, was a British professor of nutrition who had sounded the alarm on sugar back in 1972 in a book called Pure, White, and Deadly. If only a small fraction of what we know about the effects of sugar were to be revealed in relation to any other material used as a food additive, wrote Yudkin, that material would promptly be banned. Now the book did well, but Yudkin paid a high price for it. Prominent nutritionists combined with the food industry to destroy his reputation. And his career never recovered. He died in 1995, a disappointed and largely forgotten man. Now perhaps the Australian scientist intended a friendly warning. Lustig was certainly putting his academic reputation at risk when he embarked on a high-profile campaign against sugar. But unlike Yudkin, Lustig is backed by a prevailing wind. We read almost every week of new research into the deleterious effects of sugar on our bodies. In the U.S., the latest edition of the government's official dietary guidelines includes a cap on sugar consumption. In the UK, the Chancellor, George Osborne, has announced a new tax on sugary drinks. There you go. It's just another profit thing for them. Sugar has become dietary enemy number one. Now this represents a dramatic shift in priority. For at least the last three decades, the dietary arch-villain has been saturated fat. Now, when Yudkin was conducting his research into the effects of sugar in the, in the 1960s, a new nutritional orthodoxy was in the process of asserting itself. Its central tenet was that a healthy diet is a low-fat diet. And Yudkin led a diminishing band of dissenters who believed that sugar, not fat, was the more likely cause of maladies such as obesity and heart disease and diabetes. But by the time he wrote his book, the commanding heights of the field had been seized by proponents of the fat hypothesis. And Yudkin found himself fighting a rearguard action, and he was defeated. Not just defeated, in fact, but buried. And when Lustig returned to California, he searched for pure, white, and deadly in bookstores and online to no avail. Eventually, he tracked down a copy after submitting a request to his university library. And on reading Yudkin's introduction, he felt a shock of recogni recognition. Holy crap, Lustig thought. This guy got there 35 years before me. So in 1980, after long consultation with some, America, some of America's most senior nutrition scientists, the U.S. government issued its first dietary guidelines. And the guidelines shaped the diets of hundreds of millions of people. Doctors based their advice on them. Food companies developed products to comply with them. Their influence extends beyond the U.S. And in 1983, the UK government issued advice that closely followed the American example. The most prominent recommendation of both governments was to cut back on saturated fats and cholesterol. This was the first time that the public had been advised to eat less of something rather than enough of everything. And consumers dutifully obeyed. You know, just like when the doctor says you've got cancer and you've only got six months to live. If you wish to be agreeable with the doctor, odds are you're going to prove him right. But if you wish to say, I call bullshit, I'm going to get a second opinion from a nutritionist or someone else that's not going to push your poison on me, odds are you will have a lot longer to live. Odds are. They don't tell you that 95% of all cancer patients that have been treated with chemotherapy and radiation, 95% of them don't make it five years after treatment.
pretty sucky odds, don't you think? So, we replace steak and sausage with pasta and rice, butter with margarine and vegetable oils, eggs with mus uh, musel, and milk with low-fat milk or orange juice. But instead of becoming healthier, we grew fatter and sicker. Now there is a graph that they have um, a link to here. So if you look at a graph of post-war obesity rates and it becomes clear that something changed after 1980. In the US the line rises very gradually until in the early yeah in the early 80s it takes off like an aeroplane. Just 12% of Americans were obese in 1950. 15% in 1980, 35% by the year 2000. In the UK, the line is flat for decades until the mid-1980s, at which point it also turns toward the sky. Only 6% of Britons were obese in 1980. And in the next 20 years, that figure more than tripled. Today, two-thirds of Britons are either obese or overweight, making this the fattest country in the EU. Type 2 diabetes, closely related to obesity, has risen in tandem in both countries. Now I gotta put this in here as well, because yes, obesity is on the rise. I'm not saying people ain't getting heavier. Good God, they are. Health Cosmos cover. Whoo, that girl, she's a big girl. She's a pretty lady, but she's a big girl. But, what you also need to understand is they changed the guidelines as well along the way. So, my weight in the 1970s would have been considered healthy. Little on the high side, but still healthy. My weight in the 1980s still would have been considered healthy. Little on the high side, but healthy. In the year 2000, my weight would have been considered a little on the high side, but still in the acceptable range if you go to uh, BMI ratios. Still in the acceptable range. But you get up to 2010, 2012, and all of a sudden, I am overweight. And yeah, and in 2016, I was considered borderline obese. I wear either a size 8 or a size 10 in pants. And I, my weight, I am considered borderline obese. So, you have to look at how they tabulate the numbers and what the scale is that they're using to judge what is normal and what is not. What is underweight and what is overweight. I've basically weighed the same for like the last well, at least the last three or four years. Um, but yeah, just just this little bit, I went from being high side of still in the BMI indicator, okay, I'm still in that healthy range, to I'm overweight, to I'm borderline obese. In like a five-year time span, that happened. It was freaking crazy. And I, that's that's pretty much when I said, no, we ain't doing this shit anymore. So, back to the article. At best we can conclude that the official guidelines did not achieve their objective. At worst, they led to a decades-long health catastrophe. And naturally, a search for culprits has ensued. Now, scientists are conventionally um, apolitical figures, but these days, nutrition researchers write editorials in books that resemble liberal activist tr um, tracts, fizzing their righteous denunciations of big sugar and fast food. And nobody could have predicted that it was said how the food manufacturers would respond to the injunction against fat. Selling us low-fat yogurts bulked up with sugar and cakes infused with liver corroding trans fats. Now nutrition scientists, and I got to tell you, the eco has an awful lot to play with this as well. Especially if, you know, I have my magic white coat. Therefore my ego is overly inflated. 
You cannot correct me. It's kind of like CNN. You cannot question me. Now, nutrition scientists are angry with the press for distorting their findings. Politicians for failing to heed them. And the rest of us for overeating and under-exercising. So, in short, everyone, business, media, politicians, consumers, is to blame. Everyone, that is, except the scientists. Because their ego cannot take that beating. But... It was not impossible to foresee that the vilification of fat might be an error. Energy from food comes to us in three forms, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And since the proportions of energy we get from protein tends to stay stable, whatever we, or whatever we diet, a low-fat diet effectively means a high-carbohydrate diet. And the most versatile and palatable carbohydrate is sugar, which John Yudkin had already circled in red. In 1974, the UK medical journal, The Lancet, sounded the warning about the possible consequences of recommending reductions in dietary fat. The cure should not be worse than the disease. That should also be applied to chemotherapy and radiation. Radiation causes cell mutation. Chemotherapy kills the immune system. I'm thinking both of those are worse than the dis-ease. Still, it would be reasonable to assume that Yudkin lost his argument simply because by 1980, more evidence had accumulated against fat than against sugar. After all, that's how science works, isn't it? Well, once again, look at how they gathered their numbers. Look at the questions that they asked. Look at how they compiled their numbers. If, as seems increasingly likely, the nutritional advice on which we have relied for 40 years was profoundly flawed, this is not a mistake that can be laid at the door of corporate ogres, nor can it be passed off on innocuous scientific error. What happened to John Yudkin belies that interpretation. It suggests instead that this is something the scientists did to themselves, and consequently to us, because they could not starve their egos of adulation. There was no way they were going to say, I was wrong. Now we tend to think of heretics as contrarians, individuals with a compulsion to flout conventional wisdom. But sometimes a heretic is simply a mainstream thinker who stays facing the same way while everyone turns him, or around him turns a 180. When in 1957, John Yudkin first floated his hypothesis that sugar was a hazard to public health, it was taken seriously, as was its proponent. By the time Yudkin retired 14 years later, both theory and author had been marginalized and derided. Because if you cannot fight them with facts, sling the mud. Only now is Yudkin's work being returned posthumously to its scientific mainstream. Yes, dear? Oh, okay. Oh, well, Grimmy, I hope you get to feeling better and you know I understand that sweetheart I I can sense those as well when we get the when you get the weirdness in the atmosphere going on I get that so you take care of yourself hun just as a heads up Grimmy will not be doing balls to the wall tonight so I will be the end of your live entertainment for this evening lucky you said he doesn't see any geomag storms so he's going to assume something else is causing a distortion you know what, sweetie? Could very well be. Could very well be. There has been an awful lot of rumbly going on lately. Mama's core. She is a shaken. So, back to this article. 
Now, these sharp fluctuations in Yudkin's stock have had little to do with the scientific method and a lot to do with the unscientific way in which the field of nutrition has conducted itself over the years. This story was begun, or which has begun to emerge in the past decade, has been brought to public attention largely by skeptical outsiders rather than eminent nu nutritionists. In her painstakingly researched book, The Big Fat Surprise, the journalist Nina Tetchels traces the history of the proposition that saturated fats cause heart disease and reveals the remarkable extent to which its progress from controversial theory to accepted truth was driven, not by new evidence, but by the influence of a few powerful personalities, and one in particular. Her book also describes how an establishment of senior nutrition scientists at once insecure about its medical authority and vigilant for its for threats to it consistently exaggerated the case for low fat diets while turning its guns on those who offered evidence or argument to the contrary john yetkin was only the first and most eminent victim now today as nutritionists struggle to comprehend a health disaster they did not predict and may have precipitated the field is undergoing a painful period of reevaluation. It is edging away from prohibitions on cholesterol and fat and hardening its warnings on sugar without going so far as to perform a reverse turn, but its senior members still retain a collective instinct to malign those who challenge its tattered conventional wisdom too loudly. Now, to understand how we arrived at this point, we need to go back almost to the beginning of modern nutrition science. On the 23rd of September, 1955, POTUS Dwight Eisenhower suffered a heart attack. Rather than pretend it hadn't happened, Eisenhower insisted on making details of his illness public. The next day, his chief physician, Dr. Paul Dudley White, gave a press conference at which he instructed Americans on how to avoid heart disease, stop smoking, and cut down on fat and cholesterol. In a follow-up article, White cited a research, the research of a nutritionist at the University of Minnesota, Ansel Keys. Now, heart disease, which had been relatively rare in the 1920s, was now felling middle-aged men at a frightening rate couldn't have had anything to do with all that nasty stuff from World War II or World War I for that matter and Americans were casting around for cause and cure now Ansel Keys provided an answer the diet heart hypothesis or for simplicity's sake I'm calling it the fat hypothesis and this is the idea now familiar that is that an excess of saturated fats in the diet from red meat, cheese, butter, and eggs raises cholesterol, which congeals on the inside of the coronary arteries, causing them to harden and narrow until the flow of the blood is staunched and the heart seizes up. Now, Ansel Keys was brilliant, charismatic, and combative. A friendly colleague at the University of Minnesota described him as direct to the point of bluntness, critical to the point of skewering and others were less charitable he exuded conviction at a time when confidence was most welcome now the president the physician and the scientist formed a reassuring chain of male authority see there's that whole belief of authorita and a notion that fatty foods were unhealthy started to take hold with doctors and the public Eisenhower himself cut saturated fats and cholesterol from his diet altogether, right up until his death in 1969, from heart disease. A lot of good it did him. Now, many scientists, especially British ones, remained skeptical. The most prominent doctor was John Yudkin, then the UK's leading nutritionist. And when Yudkin looked at the data on heart disease, he was struck by its correlation with the consumption of sugar not fat. 
He carried out a series of laboratory experiments on animals and humans and observed, as others had before him, that sugar is processed in the liver, where it turns to fat before entering the bloodstream. He noted, too, that while humans have always been carnivorous, carbohydrates only became a major component of the diet 10,000 years ago with the advent of mass agriculture. Sugar, a pure carbohydrate with all fiber and nutrition stripped out, has been part of Western diets for just 300 years. So in evolutionary terms, it's as if we have just this second taken our first dose of it. Saturated fats, by contrast, are so intimately bound up with our evolution that they are abundantly present in breast milk. And to Yutkin's thinking, it seemed more likely to be the recent innovation rather than the prehistoric staple that was making us sick. So, okay, then they give when he was born, where he went to school, all this other fun stuff. Now, Ansel Keys was intensely aware that Yudkin's sugar hypothesis posed an alternative to his own. If Yudkin pol published a paper, Keyes would excoriate it and call or and him. And he called Yudkin's theory a mountain of nonsense and accused him of issuing propaganda for the meat and dairy industries. Yudkin and his commercial backers were not deterred by the facts, he said. They continue to sing the same discredited tune. And Yudkin never responded in kind. He was a mild-mannered man, unskilled in the art of political combat, obviously believing that the facts will speak for themselves. But when you selectively edit those facts, they can no longer speak. They have become mute, or at least unintelligible. Now that made him vulnerable to attack and not just from Keys. The British Sugar Bureau dismissed Yudkin's claim about sugar as emotional assertions. The World Sugar Research Organization called his book science fiction. In his prose, Yudkin is fastidiously precise and undemonstrative as he was in person. Only occasionally does he hint at how it must have felt to have his life's work besmirched as when he was, um, asks the reader, can you wonder that one sometimes becomes quite despondent about whether it is worthwhile trying to do scientific research in matters of health? And then you wonder why our health is in crisis mode. So, throughout the 60s, Keyes accumulated an institutional power and he secured places for himself and allies on boards of the most influential bodies in American health care, including the American Heart Association and the National Institutes of Health. And from these strongholds, they directed funds to like-minded researchers and issued authoritative advice to the nation. People should know the facts. Then, if they want to eat themselves to death, let them. Well, this apparent certainty was unwarranted. Even some supporters of the fat hypothesis admitted that the evidence for, the, for it was still inconclusive. But Keyes held a trump card. From 1958 to 1964, he and his fellow researchers gathered data on diets, lifestyles, and health of 12,770 middle-aged men in Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia, Finland, Netherlands, Japan, and the United States. The seven-country study was finally published as a 211-page monograph in 1970. It showed a correlation between intake of saturated fats and deaths from heart disease, just as Keyes had predicted. And the scientific debate swung decisively behind the fat hypothesis. Keyes was the original big data guy. So, despite its monumental stature, however, the Seven Countries study, which was the basis for a cascade of subsequent papers by its own original authors, or by its original authors, was a rickety construction. In other words, when you have a basis of lies, every, 
Everybody will build on it, which is why we are where we are today. You know, it's like a meme I shared earlier. Oh, please, Mommy, tell me Santa Claus isn't fake. Oh, no. That's not true. I mean, just think of all of the people that would have to be involved. If it starts with one lie, and you have other people that build on that lie, and then they get it into their learning institutions building on that lie and silencing any dissenters, it's no wonder. Now, <clears throat> okay, so... There was no objective basis for the countries chosen by Keyes, and it's hard to avoid the conclusions that he picked only those he suspected would support his hypothesis. After all, it is quite something to choose seven nations in Europe and leave out France and what was then West Germany, but then Keyes already knew that the French and Germans had relatively low rates of heart disease. Despite living on a diet rich and saturated fats. Depends on how you gather your evidence. Now the study's biggest limitation was inherent to its method. Epidemiological research involves the collection of data on people's behalf or behavior and health and a search for patterns. Originally developed to study infection, Keyes and his successors adapted it to study of chronic diseases, which unlike most infections, take decades to develop and are entangled with hundreds of dietary and lifestyle factors, effectively impossible to separate. So to reliably identify causes as opposed to correlations, a high standard of evidence is required. The controlled trial and, in its simplest form, recruit a group of subjects and assign half of them a diet for, say, 15 years, and at the end of the trial, assess the health of those in the intervention group versus the control group. This method is also problematic. It's virtually impossible to closely supervise the diets of large groups of people. But a properly conducted trial is the only way to conclude with any confidence that X is responsible for Y. Now, although Keyes had shown a correlation between heart disease and saturated fat, he had not excluded the possibility that heart disease was being caused by something else. And years later, the seven-year study, um, the, its lead Italian researcher, went back to the data and found that the food that correlated most closely with deaths from heart disease was not saturated fat, but sugar. But by then it was too late. The seven country study had become um, pretty much biblical. And the fat hypothesis was enshrined in official advice. The congressional committee responsible for the original dietary guidelines was chaired by Senator George McGovern. Took om or took most of its evidence from America's nutritional elite. Men from a handful of prestigious universities most of whom knew or worked with each other, all of whom agreed that fat was the problem, an assumption that McGovern and his fellow senators never seriously questioned. Only occasionally were they asked to reconsider, like in 1973, when John Yudkin was called from London to testify before the committee. A bemused McGovern asked Yudkin if he was really suggesting that a high-fat intake was not the problem and that cholesterol presented no danger. I believe both those things, replied Yudkin. That is exactly the opposite of what my doctor told me, said McGovern. See, doctors only know what they are taught at medical school, and when you control what they're being taught... Unless they step outside that box. Now, in 2015, a paper titled, Does Science Advance One Funeral at a Time? A team of scholars at the National Bureau of Economic Research sought an empirical basis for a remark made by physicist Max Planck. 
a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up um, that is familiar with it. Now the researchers identified more than 12,000 quote-unquote elite scientists from different fields. And the criteria for elite status included funding, number of publications, and whether they were members of the National Academies of Science or the Institute of Medicine. Searching obituaries, the team found 452 who had died before retirement. Then they looked to see what happened to the fields from which those celebrated scientists had unexpectedly departed by analyzing publishing patterns. And what they found confirmed the truth of Planck's maxim. Junior researchers who had worked closely with the elite scientists authoring papers with them published less. At the same time, there was a marked increase in papers by newcomers in the field who were less likely to cite the work of the deceased eminence. And the articles by these newcomers were substantive and influential, attracting a high number of citations. And they moved the whole field along. So a scientist is part of what the Polish philosopher of science Ludwig Fleck called thought collective which is a group of people exchanging ideas in a mutually comprehensible idiom. The group, suggested Fleck, inevitably develops a mind of its own. And as the individuals in it converge on a way of communicating, thinking, and feeling. This makes scientific inquiry prone to the eternal rules of human social life. Deference to the charismatic herding towards majority opinion punishment for defiance, and intense discomfort for admitting to error. Now, of course, such tendencies are precisely what the scientific method was invented to correct for. And over the long run, it does a good job of it. In the long run, however, we're all dead, quite possibly sooner than we would be if we hadn't been following a diet based on poor advice. So in a series of densely argued articles and books, including Why We Get Fat in 2010, the science writer Gary Tobbs has assembled a critique of contemporary nutrition science, powerful enough to compel the field to listen. One of his contributions has been to uncover a body of research conducted by German and Austrian scientists before the Second World War which had been overlooked by the Americans who reinvented the field in the 50s. The Europeans were practicing physicians and experts in the metabolic system. The Americans were more likely to be epidemiologists laboring in relative ignorance of biochemistry and endocrinology or the study of hormones. And this led to some of the foundational mistakes of modern nutrition. The rise and slow fall of cholesterol's infamy is a case in point. After it was discovered inside the arteries of men who had suffered heart attacks, public health officials, advised by scientists, put eggs whose yolks are rich in cholesterol on the danger list. But it is a biological error to confuse what a person puts in their mouth with what becomes it becomes after it's swallowed. The human body far from being a passive vessel for whatever we choose to fill it with, is a busy chemical tr plant, and it's transforming and redistributing the energy it receives. Its governing principle is homeostasis, or the maintenance of energy equilibrium. When exercise heats us up, sweat cools us down. Cholesterol, present in all of our cells, is created by the liver. Biochemists had long known that the more cholesterol you eat, the less your liver produces. Unsurprisingly then, repeated attempts to prove a correlation between dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol failed. For the vast majority of people, 
Eating two or three or 25 eggs a day does not significantly raise cholesterol levels. One of the most nutrient-dense, versatile, delicious foods we have was needlessly stigmatized. And the health authorities have spent the last few years slowly backing away from this mistake. Presumably, in the hope that if no sudden movements are made, maybe no one will notice. In a sense, they've succeeded. A survey carried out in 2014 by Credit Sui found that 54% of U.S. doctors believe that dietary cholesterol raises blood cholesterol. Now, to his credit, Ansel Keys realized early on that dietary cholesterol was not a problem. But in order to sustain his assertion that cholesterol causes heart attacks, he needed to identify an agent that rises its levels in the blood. And he landed on saturated fats. And in the 30 years after Eisenhower's heart attack, trial after trial failed to conclusively bear out the association he claimed to have identified in the seven countries study. Lies upon lies upon lies upon lies. Now the nutritional establishment wasn't greatly discom discomfited by the absence of definitive proof. But by 1993, it found that it couldn't evade another criticism. While low-fat diets had been recommended to women, it had never been tested on them. A fact that is astonishing only if you're not a nutrition scientist. Now, the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute decided to go all in, commissioning the largest controlled trial of diets ever undertaken. As well as addressing the other half of the population, the Women's Health Initiative was expected to obliterate any lingering doubts about the ill effects of fat. But it did nothing of the sort. At the end of the trial, it was found that women on the low-fat diet were no less likely than the control group to con contract cancer or heart disease. This caused much consternation, and the study's principal researcher, unwilling to accept the implications of his own findings, remarked that we're scratching our heads over some of these results. Now, a consensus quickly formed that the study, meticulously planned, lavishly funded, overseen by impressive credentialed researchers, must have been so flawed as to be meaningless. And the field moved on. Or rather, did not. In 2008, researchers from Oxford University undertook a Europe-wide study of the causes of heart disease. And its data shows an inverse correlation between saturated fat and heart disease across the continent. France, the country with the highest intake of saturated fat, has the lowest rate of heart disease. Ukraine, the country with the lowest intake of saturated fat, has the highest. When the British obesity researcher Zoe Hardcombe performed an analysis of the data on cholesterol levels, in 192 countries around the world, she found that lower cholesterol correlated with higher rates of death from heart disease. So in the last 10 years, a theory that had somehow held and held up unsupported for nearly half a century has been rejected by several comprehensive evidence reviews. Even as it staggers on zombie-like, in our dietary guidelines and medical advice. But the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in a 2008 analysis of all studies of the low-fat diet found no probable or convincing evidence that a high level of dietary fat causes heart disease or cancer. Another landmark review published in 2010 in the American Society for Nutrition and authored by, among others, Ronald Krauss, who is a highly respected researcher and physician at the University of California, said that there is no significant evidence for concluding the dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease 
or cardiovascular disease. So many nutritionists refuse to accept these conclusions and the journal that published Krauss's review, wary of outrage among its readers, prefaced it with a rebuttal by a former right-hand man of Ansel Keys, which implied that since Krauss's findings contradicted every national and international dietary recommendation, they must be flawed. So obviously, if you've been doing it wrong for 50 years, that just made it right because, you know, when someone else comes up with the right answer, well, that can't be right because we've been doing it wrong for 50 years and that turned it into a right. No, it didn't. Now, Gary Tobbs is a physicist by background. In physics, he told me, you look for the anomalous results. Then you have something to explain. In nutrition, the game is to confirm what you or your predecessors have always believed. As one nutritionist explained to Nina Tetchels with delicate understatement, scientists believe that saturated fat is bad for you, and there is a good deal of reluctance towards accepting evidence to the contrary. So, it, because they believe, remember there's a lie in the middle of believe, a belief is stronger than evidence when that evidence proves contradictory to what you believe. So when obesity started to become recognized as a problem in the Western societies, it too was blamed on saturated fats. And it was not difficult to persuade the, f the public that if we eat fat, we will be fat. Now the scientific rationale was also pleasingly simple. A gram of fat twice a day, as many calories as a gram of protein or carbohydrate. And we can all grasp the idea that if a person takes in more calories than she expends in physical activity, the surplus ends up as fat. Now, simple does not mean right, of course. It's difficult to square this theory with the dramatic rise in obesity since 1980. Or with much other evidence. In America, Average caloric intake increased by just a sixth over that period. In the UK, it actually fell, but has been no um, commensurate decline in physical activity in either country. In the UK, exercise levels have increased over the last 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Obesity is a problem in some of the poorest parts of the world, even among communities in which food is scarce. Controlled trials have repeatedly failed to show that people lose weight on low-fat or low-calorie diets over the long term. So those pre-war European researchers would have regarded the idea that obesity results from excess calories as laughably simplistic. Biochemists and endocrinologists are more likely to think of obesity as a hormonal disorder triggered by the kinds of food we started eating a lot more of when we cut back on fat. Easily digestible starches and sugars. And in his new book, Always Hungry, David Ludwig, an endocrinologist and professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, calls this the insulin carbohydrate. And it's a model of obesity. According to this model, an excess of refined carbohydrates interferes with the self-balancing equilibrium of the metabolic system. So far from being an inert dumping ground for excess calories, fat tissue operates as a reserve energy supply for the body. Its calories are called upon when glucose is running low or between meals or during fasts and famines. Fat takes instruction from insulin, the hormone responsible for regulating blood sugar. Refined carbohydrates break down to speed into glucose into the blood, prompting the pancreas to produce insulin. And when insulin levels rise, fat tissue gets a signal to suck energy out of the blood and to stop releasing it. 
So when insulin stays high for unnaturally long, a person gains weight, gets hungrier, and feels fatigued. Then we blame them for it. But as Terry Tobbs puts it, obese people are not fat because they're overeating and sedentary. They are overeating and sedentary because they are fat and getting fatter. Ludwig makes it clear, as Tobbs does, that is not a new theory. John Yudkin would have recognized it, but an old one that has been galvanized by new evidence. What he does not mention is the role that supports or that supporters of the fat hypothesis have played historically in demolishing the credibility of those who proposed it. Now this does go on and I have been yammering and yammering and yammering and yammering and yammering but this is really I mean it's just a it just shows you lie upon lie upon lie upon lie and you can reflect this out to anything that you want to discuss whether it's politics or medical or legal or what whatever you want to argue about or drugs whenever you you build on a false hypothesis the whole thing is a lie and when you shame and smear people because you can't have your ego bruised then the sheep those that wish to go along and get along will build upon your crumbling lie eventually it will collapse just like any government they will collapse. Totalitarian governments collapse. What we need to understand, what we need to realize, is when a government collapses, you need to have something else to step into that void because nature abhors a vacuum. And if you do not have a game plan to step in with, that's when shit hits the fan. So, coming over here to pig real quick, because I am running short of time. I know, I've blabbered on about that, but it really, and I'm going to share it with you because it's very, very important. You guys need to, you need to see how it, it details how these lies are done and how every aspect of our lives, research, 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 and you can eventually get back to where you can see where it started. And if you don't get back there, follow your gut. So, over on PIGazette.com, the word of the day is impeachment. The dams think it's a magic spell which erases the past two years, miraculously making Hildebeest POTUS. No, it does not. And Hildebeest is a very good way of putting that. In their quotable quotes section, in a world where socialism has failed so spectacularly on an international scale, again and again... China, Russia, Vietnam, Cuba, Venezuela. It takes an idiot to even consider such a sociopolitical system as a possibility. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is just such an idiot. And so are the people who support her and her party. Perhaps it's not nice to say, but it's true. And somebody has to stop America, especially the 20-somethings with the most to lose and the most likely to support these idiots before we become the wasteland that socialist countries always become. That was Dr. Hurd. Thank you, dear. Now, this date in history, the 31st of August 1935 FDR signs a bill prohibiting export of US arms to belligerents bill still f allows sale of weapons to those who are merely grouchy cranky and or crappy or pay plenty under the table this date in history the 31st of August 1949 Richard Gere actor and gerbil's worst nightmare born in Philly Oh, God, thanks. This date in history, the 31st of August, 1976. Ay, caramba, the sombrero stompers devalue the Mexican pesos. Those in the know admit that Mexico's standard of living isn't anything to write home about either. This date in history, the 31st of August, 1985. 
infamous serial killer Richard Nightstalker Ramirez presses his luck, tries to steal a car in an L.A. barrio. Locals nearly beat this murdering bastard to death before cops arrive. And finally, this date in history, the 31st of August, 1988. Holy blackouts, Batman! Downtown Seattle begins five-day power outage. Okay. Which great Northwest nitwit fell asleep at the power switch? Well, I don't know, but man, 1988, there was apparently, with it being dark, people were doing an awful lot of potty throwing. Hmm, in Seattle, that's not always a good thing. So, let's see. Let me get back to my... Um... There. I will go ahead and, and share this sugar conspiracy with you because, yeah, it's still got quite a ways to go. Um, I, I was like halfway through and I kept thinking, okay, I got to be getting close to like comment section or something, but no, I wasn't. So I, I just had to, <laughs> yeah, I will finish reading it myself later as well. But yeah, that was, it's very long, very, very detailed, which is good, and yet not always real good for live broadcast. Oh, well, good information, though. Excellent information for y'all. Okay. Okay. Let me put this over here on RLO and put it over on the uh, FN site real quick. And then I need to see if I have just one little quick thing that I can go to. Come on. I have entirely too many links open. So, time to close them. Imagine that. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Cheer here on this Freaker Friday evening. There will not be anything else live later on this evening. Grammy's got some stuff going on environmentally, and he's got some weirdness going on where he's at. And Moosey has a life. And it's Labor Day weekend, so, you know, eh, go out, have fun. Be careful on the roads if you're traveling, please, because the idiots and assholes... Wow, they go forth and multiply, and then somebody puts them behind the steering wheel, which one idiom that I had heard long, long ago, and I thought, oh my goodness, that is so true. The most dangerous component of any motorized vehicle is the nut holding the wheel, and that is definitely true, definitely true. So, please be careful if you're going somewhere. Um... Enjoy that extra day that they gave you for being such a good little laborer. And also, be sure to go and check out, um, let's see, Brother Polite Knowledge. Uh, please listen carefully. It's a video on YouTube. I will share it again for those of you that missed it. Because, yeah, this guy knows his shit. He really does. When it comes to, because uh, he helped deliver his, his own children at home. He homeschools. He doesn't do a lot of, and, and he explains why you don't want to have a birth certificate or a marriage license or any of this other fun shit. Sharp cookie. Sharp, sharp cookie. So you need to give him a listen. Um, let's see here. What do I have? What do I have? Um, nope, I'll save that one for later. I'll just go over to Yuppie. If I have Yuppie in my... <laughs> and then maybe I don't have Yuppie. Oh, man, I'm going to have to actually type the address in. Oh, man! <laughs> there it is. UPI.com. In their odd news section, I have just a couple minutes. Let's see. 
Holy shit. Holy shit. Well, you know, I keep seeing these lottery things, so maybe I need to go buy a lottery ticket one of these days. In any case, from UPI.com, text request from coworker leads to a $1 million lottery jackpot. August the 31st, a North Carolina woman sent a text message and a good deed for a co- co-worker led her to winning a $1 million lottery jackpot. Sue Manchester told North Carolina education lottery officials that she was on her lunch break last week when she received a text message that would end up changing her life. My co-worker texted during my lunch break on Friday and asked me to pick up a Red Bull. So she said she went to her usual gas station, but it was too busy. So she went to the Eagles station on Chapel Hill, where she bought the Red Bull and a colossal cash scratch-off ticket. I grabbed the Red Bull and then noticed I had a $20 or had a 20 and a $10 bill. So I decided to get one of the tickets since my coworker has been winning on it recently. And Manchester said she was back in her office when she scratched off the ticket and revealed the symbol indicating she was a million dollar winner. I saw the symbol and was like, no, this doesn't happen. I showed the same coworker and he said, Sue, you just won a million dollars. And I still didn't believe it. It's very serendipitous, especially since I rarely get scratch off tickets. Now she chose to receive her winnings as a $600,000 lump sum, which came to $423,010 after required state and federal withholdings. And yet not a bad return on what? A $10 investment? Not a bad return. Oh, well. Thank you all for listening in this evening to the Rocket Chair. Tomorrow at noon. (laughs) Yuppie? (laughs) I see Yuppie. That's Cup. Um, In any case, tomorrow at noon, Eastern Time, Flash and Vinny with the Dork Table. Sunday at noon, hopefully all of your weirdness is gone, Grimmy. We'll be Grimner hopping in to do a little bit of blues and hopefully have some fun trivia going on in the chat. And then closely followed by Hal Anthony, who's going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass. I will be back Wednesday for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of the Rocket Chair. But until then... Please be careful out there. And remember, I do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.